From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Joe Matthew, I'm Anne Marie Hordern. Today in the nation's capital, a shifting tone in negotiations over the U.S. debt ceiling. Speaker McCarthy and I have had several productive conversations, and it's time for Congress to act now. President Biden sounding optimistic about moving towards a bipartisan deal as one key Republican negotiator says the two sides are moving closer together. Plus, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis joining Elon Musk on Twitter for announcement that didn't go quite according to plan. We're just trying to, just trying to get it going because it's there's so many people. It did break the Twitter space, and so we're really excited with the enthusiasm. A rocky start to a long-expected presidential campaign, Joe. But I will say, at least a little bit of reprieve (laughs) that story from what is going on here in Washington. Because it looks like they are getting closer, but there's still no deal. And we are a week away from the start of potentially when we could see a default. Yeah, I think Patrick McHenry, who chairs the, the, the Financial Services Committee in the House uh, and has sat with us at this table, put it best today. I'm not pessimistic. He didn't go so far as to say that he's optimistic, optimistic, but he did suggest that they are getting closer, that there is maybe a path signaling that we could be on the verge of a deal here. And Marie, who knows, the next day or two, that would kind of need to happen to make the deal on time. Yes, because even if they were able to come to an agreement in terms of the negotiating teams, getting it through Congress is in a whole different ballgame. That's for sure. Remembering, of course, as well, that members have left town. Uh, it's just us sitting here now. Everybody <laughs> yeah. went home, and they may be called back this weekend if they get Or they're joining the Twitter spaces. All right. Jo- right. <laughs> joining us around the table to discuss this is Bloomberg News Congress editor Megan Scully and White House and politics editor Mario Parker. Megan, let's start with you. Just give us where we are at this moment. One week out, we are hearing better music, but to Joe's point, not everyone is joining on the optimism bandwagon, but yeah. it feels like it's neutralizing. Congressman McHenry has been definitely the glass half empty uh, <laughs> of the negotiators, so him being not pessimistic, I would say, is a, a small step forward towards that's, the deal, so yeah. that's, that's good news. Um, you know, today there, were, there have been a lot of phone calls and Zooms between the White House team and the GOP negotiators in the Capitol. Uh, they have not met in person yet today, um, but they have been communicating Uh, We presume going back and forth with numbers. Um, It it does appear that some things are squared away. There will be some kind of energy permitting legislation in there with with also some sweeteners for progressives um, to do with electric uh, electric transmission lines. Um, Defense spending, it appears, won't be as as high as Republicans had hoped, more in line with what Biden had proposed earlier this year. But there's still a lot of pieces that need to take shape, including domestic spending, the length and size of the debt ceiling increase, and whether or not work requirements are going to be in there. You put it best, uh, Anne-Marie. It's one thing to cut a deal. It's another thing to get it passed through Congress. There are a lot of concerns that the president uh, may be losing progressives in this, that Speaker McCarthy may be losing members of the Freedom Caucus. Uh, The House Minority Leader, Hakeem Jeffries, got to this earlier in a news conference today. Listen to his take. What is clear to me increasingly is that many extreme MAGA Republicans have made the political calculation that a dangerous default and crashing the economy and triggering a recession is in their political interests. One concern for Democrats here, the president, Mario, is that, yeah, we cut a deal uh, with Speaker McCarthy, but we don't know if he actually has the votes in his own Republican caucus. Is that slowing things down? No, absolutely. I mean, that's the that's part of what, what's being discussed right now. Again, all of this is occurring through the backdrop of what we saw in January with that 15 vote for him to get the yeah. gavel. That's informed a lot of the White House's thinking. Some of it has been a miscalculation on the part of the White House, to be sure. But that is something that it, that is an elephant in the room, whether or not he can hold his caucus together. And to what degree President Biden can even hold some of the Democrats together as well. Well, it's a similar story on both sides, isn't it? Yes. It's- Exactly. We heard from Speaker McCarthy, and this is exactly what he had to say. He's trying to sit down with the president, but there are progressives in the room who are pushing him. I believe we have that sound. Let's take a listen to what he had to say earlier today. 
the difficult part is the Democrats today are not the same Democrats. They're very extreme. They're much more on the socialist wing. We see them up their anger right now against the president when he's trying to curb spending at the same time negotiating with me. That's not productive, but it's, it's really challenging. So even if Biden wins in terms of not defaulting, because he gets a deal, how much does he lose because he angers so many in his party? Well, 2024 is upon us, right? We saw the, the, the unrelated Twitter uh, gaffe last night. <laughs> we'll but get it's to a, that. It's upon us. And so you're going to need progressives. And, and for someone uh, of President Biden's age, et cetera, he's going to also need to lean on surrogates. So he's going to have to lean on those AOCs, the Jayapals, all those folks to really uh, carry his message. And while they may still do it because he's a Democratic president, you want, the, want them to have full buy-in and be able to look their concerns constituents in the face and say, this is what we delivered for you. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the numbers here for a moment, because nothing's been hammered out. And we understand that they are getting closer on top line figures. We're not going to be writing any budgets here, uh, but we're looking for some big numbers. And uh, we did hear about that from Corrine Jean-Pierre, the press secretary at the White House. If we can get uh, to her comment on that, let's listen. We are negotiating with Republicans in good faith. And uh, we, uh, as, as I mentioned yesterday and as the president mentioned on Sunday, we offered an additional uh, um, cut to the spending of $1 trillion on top of the $3 trillion that we mentioned uh, in our budget. So this is, the, this is the big item to negotiate here, right, to actually get to a number that sounds like it's not going to be the $130 billion the speaker's looking for. Is that safe to say? I think so. What they're trying to do, though, is, is figure out how to count these numbers, right? So there's a pretty widespread agreement to claw back some COVID spending that was not that was not ever used by the states. So that's $65 billion right there. So that gets you pretty much halfway to that $130 billion. But do you count that in the savings? Are you looking for $130 billion on top of that? Mm -hmm. Do you look just in the discretionary budget, or do you look into mandatory programs, um, the, the, the social programs and whatnot that the government has to, has to pay into? So they're, they're essentially trying to figure out not just what to cut, mm -hmm. but how to count what they cut. $65 billion of those unspent COVID funds, that's more than the Treasury has today. Today, the Treasury's <laughs> oh cash balance fell to $49. Yeah. $0.5 billion, one of the smallest we've seen since 2021. Um, so although there was Republicans talking about Janet Yellen maybe putting her thumb on the scale, potentially tre the Treasury Secretary is correct. But, mm -hmm. Megan, is it not odd that they're able to kind of hammer out some of the agreement in terms of the items that are on the margins, whether it's work requirements, defense spending, but they still have not been able to fully come to a top-line figure? Isn't that where they should be starting? Isn't that the meat and bones of the deal? You would think so, uh, but that just there's so many interests at in, at stake here, and there's so much, so many inputs. You know, we we talked about the progressives. McCarthy's dealing with his conservative flank. That um, you know, while this the negotiations have whittled down to a handful of hand-picked negotiators, that doesn't mean that members aren't calling. You know, aren't aren't calling the speaker, aren't calling the president. Um, Congressman McHenry uh, said he's fire. Yeah, he said he's getting messages from from Wall Street left and right, um, and his text messages are a dumpster fire. So <laughs> there's a lot of cooks in this kitchen. No wonder why his glass is half empty. <laughs> <laughs> you have to feel for the man. Uh, we talked today with Mark Zandi on Bloomberg Sound on, on on Bloomberg Radio today. This is the chief economist at Moody's Analytics. While everybody's talking about optimism. I would say, Mark, you must be feeling good about this. Are we about to get a deal? Uh, listen to his take. I'll have to tell you, I'm getting more nervous. Um, oh yeah, just talking to folks in D.C., both on the Hill and the administration, it just feels like this thing can really go off the rails. Uh, the politics are just so vexed. Mario, he put the odds of a default at one in four. He said he's more nervous today than he was just a couple of days ago. Who are we supposed to believe here? Well, his job is to be super careful, to yes, be sure. Sure He's supposed to screen the credit of everyone. <laughs> and he's seen what we've been through in 2011. We saw the alert that Fitch uh, uh, put out last night as well. So it's uh, just doing the due diligence. Mm -hmm. And again, while everything is, by all accounts, there is optimism, 
This is a different Washington than what we saw in 2011. That 2011 creature that we saw has essentially manifested and grown itself over the last decade plus here now to what we have here past the Tea Party into this MAGA movement as well, where there is a, a wing of the party that wouldn't mind or isn't afraid, I should say, of yeah. defaulting. Some yeah. don't even believe that we would default, or if we defaulted, We've it would be that bad. We've been hearing from a bad. lot of them, you're right. Right. So if we were to get to an agreement, though, which if we believe everyone at their word, they are getting closer, Megan, tell us how difficult this is going to be to pass, and how long would it actually take to pass the House and the Senate? So, you know, to get McCarthy, as part of his deal to become Speaker, promised that he would give lawmakers 72 hours to read legislation. Mm -hmm. Nobody actually ever reads legislation, <laughs> but this is a That's this comforting. is sort of a I'm good so faith down, offer. Um, that, uh, and, and it's something that McCarthy has said time and again he would stick to. So that's three days right there. So if they got a deal tomorrow, they, write, they still have to write the legislation. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you're talking maybe like a Tuesday vote in the House. The Senate, um, we've already seen at least one senator, Senator Mike Lee from Utah, come out and say, absolutely not, I am going to put the brakes on anything. It only takes one senator to gum up the works over there. So, you know, so that, that already gets us past June 1st. Probably what we're going to need is some kind of like a three-day suspension to the debt ceiling um, that passes the House. And then, you know, McCarth McConnell, Senator McConnell over there is going to have to really try to do some arm twisting yes. to get the, the Mike Lees of the world not to object to that so that can pass before June 1st. That's my guess at this point. But yeah. actually two Sounds votes. easy to me. Yeah. Maybe not. Yeah. Uh, and we wait. Thanks uh, to a great panel of Bloomberg's Megan Scully and Mario Parker with us at the table here on Balance of Power. Coming up more on the debt ceiling debate, we're going to get the latest from Democratic Congressman Seth Moulton of Massachusetts. That's next on Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg. American people deserve to know that the Social Security payments will be there. The Veterans Hospital will remain open, and that economic progress will be made, and we're going to continue to make it. Default puts all that at risk. Congressional leaders understand that, and they've all agreed there will be no default. And it's time for Congress to act now. President Biden today addressing the ongoing debt negotiations at the White House and joining us now is Democratic Congressman Seth Moulton of Massachusetts, live from the North Shore. Congressman, it's great to see you. We're hearing talk here in Washington that there could be a deal uh, before the weekend. I know that you're, like many members, on call right now. Are you prepared to fly back to Washington this Memorial Day? Yes, of course. Uh, good to see you too, Joe. And look, uh, this is incredibly important work. We should not be in this crisis to begin with. Uh, but Democrats from the beginning have stood ready to end it. Uh, that's why we raised the debt ceiling three times under President Trump. We didn't like Trump. We didn't like his policies. We didn't like his massive tax cut that's contributed substantially to the deficit that we have today. But we raised the debt ceiling because that's the right thing to do for the country. So I signed a discharge petition with every other House Democrat uh, that would yeah. put forward a clean raise of the debt ceiling bill. We just need five Republicans to sign on that. That could happen tonight. And I'd be on the first plane back to Washington. What are you hearing in terms of how much progress they've actually made? It does seem like everyone says they are getting closer. Um, but what are you hearing in terms of top line figures? I mean, we're not hearing much, to be perfectly honest. The reality here is that whatever is negotiated between Biden and McCarthy, McCarthy then has to go back to the extremists in his party, the very same extremists who are forcing this crisis to begin with, to see whether it will pass muster, whether he can even get the votes from his caucus. Remember, this is a speaker who just barely became speaker. He had to try over a dozen times to get the votes to become speaker, and ultimately he relied on the votes of Marjorie Taylor Greene Matt Gates. I mean, some of the most extreme politicians this country has ever seen. 
and he's got to get their votes for a deal. So that's why this is so tenuous and uh, why we're waiting to the very last minute to get it done. Congressman, there's talk uh, uh, that that Republicans are backing off uh, demands for higher defense spending. Bloomberg is reporting that negotiators have changed their tune on this uh, a bit as they talk to the White House. Is that good news or bad? I mean, look, isn't this ironic uh, that here they are saying the government is spending too much and they want to raise defense spending right now? I'm on the House Armed Services Committee. I'm a Marine veteran. Yeah. I understand how critical defense spending is. But I'll tell you that we don't need to raise it further from what the president has already requested. The president has requested an increase in defense spending. And the smarter that we become with defense spending, the less dollars it actually takes to meet our needs around the world. Let's not forget, we have a war going on in Ukraine, but we've provided additional money. We've passed significant, sub substantial additional appropriations to cover that mm -hmm. cost. So when you look in aggregate, over the past year, we've actually been spending a whole lot on defense that's not even contained just in the defense budget itself. When it comes to defense, you have this uh, op-ed out about um, artificial intelligence, how there needs to be a convention around it, guardrail sent around it. But if the Pentagon was to study and potentially use more artificial intelligence, wouldn't they need more money for that? No, actually, this is a great example of exactly what I'm talking about. If you use artificial intelligence, uh, it's so efficient that you don't require a lot of other things. You don't require as many soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines because AI can actually replace a lot of the rote tasks, a lot of the simple data management kind of tasks uh, that many of our troops do today. So implement more AI, you actually save defense dollars. That's exactly the kind of modernization and innovation that I've been pushing the Defense Department to do for a long time. It will make us better prepared to meet our adversaries around the world, better prepared to deter wars like uh, the, you know, the potential war over Taiwan and the Pacific. We want to make sure that that never happens. But here's the, the amazing thing is that if we modernize more quickly to meet that threat, we can actually save money in the process. You also highlighted the potential dark side of AI and weapons. It was a fascinating read, Congressman. You quoted Vladimir Putin, of all people, who said the leader of AI will rule the world. Are we about to enter an AI arms race? We are. In fact, I think we're already in it. And China right now is investing more as a percentage of their defense budget than we are, about twice as much. And the risk here is that people like Vladimir Putin get ahead in AI and then set the rules of the road for its use. So imagine imagine today a Russian military scientist go to Vladimir Putin and say, we have completely autonomous uh, airplanes and even robots, like literally to replace soldiers on the ground uh, that can go into combat in place of your troops. And, and they're gonna be careful to avoid civilian casualties and collateral damage. Uh, but if you just flip this switch, they don't care, they'll kill anything in their path. That's the risk here, that there are no moral guidelines. There's no moral compass for autonomous weapons, or at least it's very easy to shut it off. And given the destruction, I mean, I mean, Vladimir Putin is literally erasing Ukrainian cities. You can very easily imagine him flipping that switch. That's what's so dangerous about this. I think it could be even more dangerous than nuclear weapons because we haven't established any kinds of restrictions. We haven't established any international treaties, no Geneva conventions uh, to restrict how this is used and prevent it from going to the extremes that I just described. So this is really dangerous stuff. It's why the Pentagon needs to get ahead of it, uh, where right now we're behind. And we need to have a real diplomatic effort, not just with our allies, but with our adversaries to set the rules of the road uh, for the use of AI in warfare. Terrifying. Well, yes, terrifying. And also, we have Russia leaving the New START Treaty. So it seems like, Congressman, this would be a very difficult path forward if it was to get our adversaries, U.S. adversaries, on board with something you're discussing. Uh, an incredible piece, and, yeah. I, I, and I urge everyone to go, to go read it. Thank you so much for your time, Congressman Seth Moulton of Massachusetts. Coming up in the program, downgrade risk rearing its head once again. Fitch placing the U.S.'s AAA credit on rating watch negative as the debt ceiling drama drags on. Love we'll those details next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg.
what global markets and American households and businesses need to see is that we have a Congress that's committed um, to paying the bills. And if Congress fails to do that, it really impairs our credit rating. We have to default on some obligation. That was Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen speaking with me earlier this month about the risks that the debt limit drama poses to the U.S.'s credit rating. And, of course, rating agencies are now issuing warnings of their own. Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines is here with more. So we got the notice from Fitch. Yep. What's next? Well, it's a good question because we're watching the Treasury's cash, cash pile dwindle before our eyes. We got the latest data today. It is now south of $50 billion, $49.5 billion. Not only is that the lowest level since 2021, there are also 24 individuals on the Bloomberg Billionaires Index that have more money than the Treasury has in <laughs> its coffers on. right now. Maybe they can pay their bills. And this is what credit rating agencies are paying <laughs> attention to when they're trying to assess the credit worthiness of the U.S. as a borrower. So what Fitch came out yesterday and said is that the U.S. is on ratings watch negative, that it is at risk of losing that AAA credit rating because what, a Fitch, what Fitch cites as political partisanship that is hindering reaching a resolution on raising the debt ceiling. So basically, we could see history repeat itself because, remember, we've seen a downgrade tied to the debt limit impasse before. S&P Global Ratings cut the U.S. from AAA back in 2011. We still haven't regained that status mm. at S&P. And we know what happened in the markets 12 years ago. You saw a 7% drop in the S&P 500. Gold was getting a massive bid. There was a lot more turmoil than we're seeing currently, although you're certainly seeing it in parts of the Treasury market with those yields on uh, T-bills maturing in June up five and a half, six and a half percent at the moment. The conversation uh, around a potential downgrade, though, seems to be a lot different now than it was in 2011, where yeah. the agencies actually want to see a default, apparently, before uh, before they take action. So this warning was interesting. Remembering yeah. last time around when we went through this, the downgrade followed the deal being mm -hmm. cut. Now we're waiting yeah. for a deal to be cut, and, and there seems to be less urgency on their part. Well, and there's also the question of what actually constitutes a default, right? This idea of prioritization, that as yeah. long as the Treasury continues to pay bondholders, that it's not actually a default. And what's interesting, if you take a look inside the Fitch statement, they did say that prioritization paying that would not constitute as a default. But some of the other alternatives that, in theory, could get us out of the situation, something like a trillion-dollar coin or mm -hmm. the 14th Amendment, they said would be unlikely consistent with a AAA rating. So even if we were to use one of those methods, we still could see it result in a downgrade in theory. So you just bursted a lot of balloons on the trillion dollar coin. I really? know, don't tell Joe Wise at all. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I yeah, there's a lot of people that still think that is realistic. Yeah, or the 14th Amendment yeah. for that matter, but their point is that could actually generate a downgrade in, in itself. Yeah, they don't think that necessarily means that the U.S. is as credit worthy as AAA. Well, I uh, hope you guys don't have weekend plans. <laughs> <laughs> That's going around here in Washington. Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines. Uh, great reporting, Kaylee, and thank you. How many billionaires? 21? 24. 24 billionaires. Coming up today marks three <laughs> years since the murder of George Floyd. We're going to discuss what has changed since then and what has not. Next, this is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. I'm Joe Matthew in Washington alongside Anne-Marie Hordern. We're joined by Kaylee Lines as well as we try to figure the way forward here and follow the bead on these negotiations uh, involving the debt ceiling with the little information that we have. But some words of optimism really seems to be leading the day here. Uh, Speaker McCarthy uh, even suggesting that we could be on the path to striking a deal. Patrick McHenry saying he's not pessimistic, but still For signaling... For him, he's optimistic. That's, that, that, that's a good to thing. Megan. Signaling, though, that something might come out in the next 24 to 48 hours, which kind of needs to happen. It does need to happen, but also Speaker McCarthy yesterday said potentially we can have an agreement by the weekend. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was hedging himself, because I think what they would really like to do is get an agreement before the weekend. Yes. He, has, he needs 72 hours to make sure that his caucus can read it. This was a promise he made to his conference. Right. Um, and what better way to do that than when a Monday off and everyone's home in their exactly. districts going to parades and in between those stops, you can maybe read some legislation. Yeah, that's right. And we wonder what kind of an earful they might be getting while they are at home marching in those parades, mm -hmm. right, Kaylee? I mean, we've talked about this with a few lawmakers uh, who got on airplanes earlier today, yet they're all on call should they need to come back. Well, and there's also lawmakers who didn't 
get on airplanes, right? We were speaking with Congresswoman Debbie Dingell That's earlier right. today, who was supposed to officiate her goddaughter's wedding in Italy. That's right. And canceled that trip because, in theory, she needs to be able to come back on 24 hours notice. And when you're in Italy, that isn't necessarily so easy. And she said the reason why is she's hearing from constituents mm -hmm. about how concerned they are about this issue. And she needs to be here in Washington to address it. Yeah. Uh, we did speak with uh, the Congresswoman from Michigan. Uh, listen to the story that she told about hearing from these constituents at this critical time. It's irresponsible for the Republicans to let us leave town when we could default. We should not be holding our economy hostage. I had a constituent who called my office yesterday and she said, I was going to buy a house. But what happens if you default and the economy tanks? I can't afford a high interest loan. I mean, people are worried and we've got a job to do and we should be doing it. She really brought that sense of emotion to us here, the sense of urgency. And I guess she's going to be watching her. She was going to officiate that wedding, Anne-Marie. She's going to be watching it on Facebook Live. I'd be pretty upset if I was the goddaughter. I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we'll be, of course, keeping you up to date on the negotiations as we learn more in moving forward here on Balance of Power. Separately now, the murder of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police three years ago today looked to some observers like a catalyst that would spark a wave of reforms. While police departments across the nation have made some changes, there has not been significant federal action to ban chokeholds and other controversial practices. And joining us now is longtime civil rights activist Rashad Robinson, the president of the group Color of Change. Rashad, it's great to have you. Thanks for joining us for this important conversation today here on Bloomberg. Uh, the George Floyd Policing Act did not ever become law. But we have seen changes on the local level, on state levels across the country, at least in some cases. I wonder your view now and how you would gauge or, or, or rate the level of progress that we've seen in the last three years when it comes to policing. You know, progress is hard and change doesn't happen overnight. But there, you know, there's a it's a mixed bag, you know, and on the local level in a lot of places, we are operating inside of a new context where people are fighting and, and are pushing. And we've elected reform-minded district attorneys and re-elected them in many places who are working to um, advance a new sense of policy. Uh, at the mm -hmm. um, federal level, we have been able to achieve a set of executive orders from this president. Um, and I was just in a meeting earlier today um, with the president and other civil rights leaders. Um, I was on Zoom, but it was a White House meeting um, where we talked about sort of a range of, um, you know, the ongoing work to fight for justice reform and fight for the type of changes um, that are necessary. But, you know, I think it's important for all of us to understand that change is not a straight line and that part of what we're dealing with is deep entrenched forces that are always going to pop their head up and stand in the way of change. So I've sat in meetings where those in the police unions um, will say that there's no such thing as racial profiling or no changes need to happen. We watch corporations who have made all sorts of commitments or announcements, um, but then work to elect folks who stand in the way of progress and change. Um, what we have to recognize is that what happens in Washington, D.C. is one piece of the puzzle. But all around the country, we need more people in motion, and we need to hold all of the people accountable who are standing in the way of change. You mentioned you were, you were with the president today speaking about this. Do you think this White House has, has done enough? Um, this White House has fought, and I believe done, as much as they can on their own. You know, they are one piece of the federal government, and Congress has to pass a law before the president can sign it. And, you know, what we saw with the George Floyd Policing Act was um, a lot of obstruction, right? The act needed 60 votes to get through the Senate, which means it didn't just need Democrats, but needed a set of Republicans as well. And, um, mm -hmm. and we're not in a place where we're going to end the filibuster right now. And so, as a result, while the George Floyd and Policing Act um, passed the House um, during the last session, it didn't pass the Senate because it didn't have the vote, so it never got to the president's desk to sign. But in mm -hmm. um, the absence of that, he did move a whole set of executive orders. The challenge with executive orders is that um, they really only, for the most part, deal with um, the federal government. And so much of what happens with policing, what we saw with Tyree Nichols, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many others, happens at the local level. 
So until we actually yep. create the type of accountability and reforms at the local level that deal with the money and the resources, but there's more happening. Just recently, myself, along with two other um, civil rights leaders, um, met with Secretary Buttigieg to talk about pretextual traffic stops in the this administration's um, um, ongoing commitment, if they have it, to actually using all their levers to deal with this. Because the fact of the matter is, is so many of these traffic stops, which are funded by the federal government, end up in incidents like we saw with Tyree Nichols in Memphis and other sort of incidents around the country. So there are ways that we can continue at the federal level to advance change, to deal with how money flows to local governments, um, to make sure there's accountability behind the federal dollars, all of those things are going to be necessary in order to advance as much as we can in this moment and to make sure that as we look back at what happened three years ago, that we recognize that um, change isn't just about a changed conversation. Change is about a changed set of rules. Rashad, we've seen action on body cams on police and, and in many cases bans on chokeholds. And I know the president addressed that as well. But it's, it's the issue of immunity, right? Qualified immunity that has slowed down legislation in many cases, certainly on the federal level. Is that kind of the holy grail for you here? Is that the end game to address? So, you know, it's really interesting. Qualified immunity is incredibly important. And, and if you don't have accountability for individual police officers, um, then we actually don't have much to, to kind of hold to, you know, every industry, there's a level of accountability and police officers can sort of operate and behave however they want and will never be held accountable. In fact, taxpayers are regularly held accountable for the actions of police when police are not actually held accountable for their own actions. Um, but, you know, Right now, today, for many people who stand in the way of change, who stand in the way of uh, accountability, they will say it's qualified immunity, and they can't get there be because of a qualified immunity. But if we gave up qualified immunity tomorrow and say, hey, let's pass the George Floyd Act without qualified immunity, those same people right. wouldn't be with us then. And so this is actually a, just a, a really important point that we have to all understand, that there are those that will constantly move the ball, move the line. They want us to be sort of uh, Charlie Brown to their Lucy, where they keep pulling the ball away, when we recognize that we do have to stand strong, because whatever legislation we pass has to be meaningful. And so we don't want to pass legislation and advance legislation for legislation's sake. We want to make sure that we're passing rules that actually are meaningful. I know that's considered controversial in many quarters, but something we need to talk about. Rashad, thank you for being with us on this day. Rashad Robinson, president of the group Color of Change here on Bloomberg. Coming up more on the fallout of the U.S. debt ceiling showdown, we'll break it down with our political panel next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. somewhat of an issue of wills and desire uh, to not blink uh, and you know the whole world is watching i don't foresee uh, a situation where there would be a, a default uh, uh, that that speaks to the u.s government paying principal and interest uh, on a on a timely basis that was Blackstone Group CEO and Chairman Stephen Schwartzman yesterday at the Qatar Economic Forum giving his thoughts on the debt ceiling impasse. For more on the debt negotiation waiting game, we're joined by our political panel, Lisa Kamusa miller Reset Public Affairs Partner, and Jim Kessler, Third Way Executive Vice President. So Joe and I really love this quote from Patrick McHenry, quote, I'm not pessimistic. <laughs> so he's not fully optimistic, but potentially you do see a road for a potential deal. What do you think? Do you agree we'll get a deal soon? I do. Default? I, I do. And uh, I talked to four Democratic House members this morning. They were all feeling pretty confident that a deal would happen. None of them actually knew what exactly would be in well, the deal. That's but what Congressman Moulton just told Joe and I. He said, we don't know what's in it. Yeah, well, the, the room has gotten very, very small. Yeah. But I mean, look, 
It's going to be some sort of discretionary cap. There's going to be some sort of rescission of COVID funds. There's going to be some permitting reform. There's going to be a few cats and dogs. Like, we all know what the parameters <laughs> are going to be on this. We've known it for six months. I didn't know anything about the cats and dogs. But, uh, <laughs> Lisa, it, it does look like that Speaker McCarthy is counting votes right now and how many folks he can count on as we hear more pushback uh, from the Freedom Caucus that's, you know, causing him to bring some some bluster to the conversation, but he knows at some point he needs to, to cut a deal that can pass the Senate. That's exactly right. I mean, there's just, there's only so many people he can make happy, and we all know, I mean, everyone that's in Washington knows that the Freedom Caucus is going to continue to ask for more, because that is the way that they do their business. Mm -hmm. Let's, I mean, let's face it, there is a very small percentage of those members that have actually even been here since the last time we had to raise the debt ceiling. So they're new to this argument, they're new to this discussion, and maybe they don't even realize what is at stake here. Well, is there a risk with members going home, back to their a district seeing their constituents, they come back emboldened to ask for more. You know, I've heard it go both ways. I've heard yes, and we saw this once before, how they go home, they hear from their constituents, it's yeah. Memorial Day weekend, they're going to be doing town halls and other kinds of interactions, and they'll be hearing about it. But also, too, when they come back, June 1 is only two days to go, right? And this is the threat. The threat is that we go over the cliff and things get really bad here in the U.S., and then what? Then they go home the following week and they have to answer for that. So what is the political risk? I think it's very high if they do not get this done. Jim, you worked for Chuck Schumer. Uh, the question that we keep hearing from Speaker McCarthy now and Patrick McHenry is, why hasn't the Senate done it? Where's the Senate on this? Maybe actually we could have figured out something new here. Why is the Senate so quiet on this? Why is it left to the House? Well, the Democratic proposal was essentially the Biden proposal. And then what happened is when Mitch McConnell said, look, I'm going to f defer to Kevin McCarthy, what that means is Schumer can't get 60 votes unless, Kev unless Mitch McConnell says, look, I'm going to play ball. Hmm. So the Senate, it's not that their hands are tied. It means that their negotiations are going to be behind closed doors, and they're, they can't be a first mover. How difficult is it going to be, though, to get this through the Senate where one senator holds so much power? Well, I mean, look, here's the situation. There's no bill that can win 185 House Republicans and 45 Senate Democrats, okay? So whatever bill is going to, you know, probably 40 Senate Democrats plus 20 more Senate Republicans and 140 House Republicans, like, there's going to be some unhappy people there. Yeah. But they're going to have to move. I keep hearing that a lot. Yeah, not well, Speaker everyone's going McCarthy to be happy. himself <laughs> said that, right? That I mean, look, I guess that's the definition of compromise. But if that's the case, why is Speaker McCarthy listening so closely? to the Freedom Caucus right now, knowing they probably will not vote for the deal he cuts. I think he's giving them an audience. I yeah. mean, this is what he has to do. Politically, he's the speaker for all of the House, and they're the noisiest. They're making the most noise, and so he has to hear them out. Mm. But I also know that if he's called in uh, Patrick McHenry and has these smart uh, members that are part of the conversation, that he knows that we have to do what's right for the country in a policy way that makes really good sense. Yeah, certainly. I, I think also... The speaker spoke about that earlier. He said we need an agreement that's worthy of the American public. That's right, yeah. We talked a little bit about this yesterday. I thought potentially we'd see a shift in tone today, but we haven't from the White House. So I'm going to ask you this question because I know how Lisa feels about it. Speaker McCarthy is out and about every day talking about this. He is winning the airwaves. Is the White House not doing enough <clears throat> on that front? I don't think the message battle here matters at all. Look, this is what Joe Biden wants. He wants to make sure that a deal is done so that the, nothing from Washington derails the economy and that he doesn't do any real disruption to his agenda. Mm. He's going to get that. And, you know, McCarthy needs to do enough to keep his job. Well, so that's the big question here, right? Because it does seem that Kevin McCarthy has, at least in the near term, in the immediate, has painted, rhetorically painted Joe Biden into a bit of a corner. But, but what's the, the, the story look like two or three years from now? I suspect Joe Biden's trying to play the long game here. He promised no drama. That was a big part of his platform yeah. uh, to run for president here, that he's not going to take the bait, that he's the steady hand, he's not out there yakking every day. Does that actually, in the long run, benefit Joe Biden? I mean, we're about to get into a political fight regardless because 24 is only a minute away. Yeah. But I also, it's surprising to me how much the press secretary takes shots at the other side. Hmm. So maybe from the bully pulpit, when, while it's not the president making those kinds, taking those kinds of shots, the press secretary certainly has been very critical of House Republicans in terms of this debate and how it's unfolding.
All right, coming up, our political panel is sticking with us as we take a look at the latest contender to formally enter the 2024 presidential race. Yeah, we're going at Twitter Spaces next. Truth must be our foundation, and common sense can no longer be an uncommon virtue. Ron DeSantis kicking off his campaign after grappling with some technical difficulties, we'll say. More on that next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. Ron DeSantis making his long-awaited presidential announcement in a conversation, if we can call it that, on Twitter with Elon Musk. It did not go smoothly. The team suffering technical difficulties, freezing audio before getting off the ground, about 30 minutes behind schedule. They went to another space with many fewer viewers or listeners, I guess. Musk forced to make some fast decisions to get the governor online. That was insane. Sorry. We uh, uh, I'm actually doing this from uh, David Sachs's Twitter account uh, because uh, it looks like doing it from mine basically <laughs> broke the Twitter system. President Biden poked fun at the glitchy launch with a tweet that had a link to his own campaign site saying, this link works. For more, we welcome back our political panel, Lisa Camuso miller Reset Public Affairs Partner, and Jim Kessler, Third Way Executive Vice President. Uh, Lisa, I'm guessing if you were advising the candidate, that might not have been your plan. But did he actually do any damage last night? He made a lot of people laugh. He got some fun headlines. But did this hurt the campaign? I don't know. Somebody smarter than me once said that no press is bad press. But yeah. this, to me, just seems like a bad day for the governor. But we expected it, right? We expected it to go poorly. Maybe expectations had been lowered. People did pay attention. He has had a day full of news and attention on mm -hmm. who he is. Uh, I, like I made the joke yesterday, I certainly wouldn't be feeling very good about my campaign if I had advised the governor to do that himself. Right. But it's, uh, it, was a, it was a total flop for him yesterday. It's very odd to me that they didn't flush this through, through and have trial runs. Where, to the well, where's Times, the advance group? The advance, no advance team to work this out before. But obviously, the most important part for at least the governor, what he wants to see is campaign dollars rolling in. Mm -hmm. And I believe within that first hour or so, um, they, they made like a, a million dollars, which seems pretty much on par with what other people make. I remember, though, Bernie Sanders in the first 24 hours brought in six million. Um, do you think this made a big enough splash where he will start seeing those campaign dollars come in? I think it was a belly flop, which is a kind of splash. <laughs> I mean, look, I think we saw sort of two contrasting strategies going forward. He wants to show that he's young and different and daring and bold and is going to do something different. At the same time, like when you're doing an announcement for your campaign, you want to control things as much as possible. You want to get your message out. And those two things clashed and it fell apart. And I think it's, it, is it fatal? Mm. I don't think so, but it's damaging and it's not helpful. Well, there's also the matter of competency here, right? This is the man who's supposed to make things work. He can run things. He's a leader. He's got a team that knows how to back him up. And none of that was on display last night. Is that a problem? No. Yes, I think it's a problem. But I also think that, to, to Jim's point, I think that this is a very early announcement. I'm having a hard time recalling the way other candidates have announced their candidacy unless it was something really outside of the box. Mm. Unfortunately for the governor, it, because it was such a damaging and, and silly way to announce, perhaps that's the way he gets remembered. But this is a long game. This is a long time to go. And so I'm not necessarily, not necessarily sure this does damage beyond sort of the rest of this week. Lucky for the governor, it's Memorial Day weekend, so everybody's going to go home and barbecue. <laughs> What does this mean for the other candidates? I mean, Nikki Haley is going to have her own CNN town hall. Do you think donors start to look around and say, well, that was a flop? I should potentially start paying attention to Tim Scott, Nikki Haley, and others that are getting in the race? I was surprised today at how many people that I have worked with and have known were announcing their support for the governor, actually, in spite of all of this. So while I do think that people are still looking around, still shopping, and looking for perhaps a better candidate, I also think that the people that are with the governor are staying with the governor. They don't see this as anything but just an early announcement that didn't quite go the, right, the way that they'd hoped. The White House actually tweeted a, a kind of a spoof video, their version of what happened last night with feedback and everyone coughing. It was kind of outrageous. So I, I, apparently Joe Biden's campaign is prepared to engage now, even as this Republican primary is underway. Is that the right move? 
It is, but I also think this shows what Ron DeSantis's problem is because he's in the unenviable position of being in second place, mm -hmm. which means you're attacked by Donald Trump from above, yeah. also by Joe Biden, and by everybody who's below you. And you've got to be very good to get through that and do it well. Wow. And most candidates do not do it well. Right. Yeah, and that's what we saw on display right. yesterday. All right, our thanks to Lisa Camusa Miller and Jim Kessler. You can check out all these stories and more on the Washington Edition newsletter that's on the terminal and online. Thanks for joining us on Balance of Power. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Live from Washington, D.C., this is Bloomberg.